I'm uh, Fred Weston. Uh, I'm a leading member of the uh, Revolutionary Communist International. And uh, this is the Communism Autocomplete interview. A spectre is haunting Europe. The spectre of communism. Communism. Stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what and welcome, like. comrades. I'm Joe Assad, and this is the Spectre of Communism. And this week, we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, we've had a few suggestions via social media and people writing into the website that it would be good to hear some questions from people who don't consider themselves to be communists yet. Uh, people who might have a variety of opinions about communism, who might not understand what communism is, what it stands for, what we actually believe. And we were thinking about how we could actually do this. And I thought, you know what, what's the most broad and popular forum I can possibly use to canvas some questions? So I went to Google and I used the autocomplete function to generate the most popular questions people are searching online when it comes to communism. And we're very lucky to have Fred with us again to answer some of these questions from his expert's perspective. So question one, what do communists believe? What, what, do we, what do we believe? What do we stand for? We stand for the abolition of class society. We stand for uh, publicly owned means of production, planned under the control of the workers themselves, and that the, what they produce is for the benefit of the whole of society collectively. The word believe to me sort of implies um, you have a belief in something without any scientific proof or any real material basis to it, but it's you believe this because you assume certain things or you have prejudice about certain things. You know, communists believe this and communists believe that. That's not what it's about. It's not a religion. Um, it's about an understanding of the world from a class point of view, first of all. We think in terms of the interests of the working class, of working people, people who have to work to live, to earn a wage. Um, and we look at it from the point of view, where did this society come from? How did we get to where we are as a society? And where are we going? Now, that, in that implies several aspects. One, a thorough study of history not just the recorded history of society, um, but uh, going further back than that, you know, archaeological, uh, etc. Uh, even, even, even genetic studies these days give us a lot of information about the past. To get a much longer view of historical development from the very, very early uh, forms of the human species, the, the, let's call them, some people don't like these words, you know, the the primitive uh, humans, um, who, as they emerged from the animal world and started to become human, um, as they learnt to survive in, in this world, developing different techniques, developing tools, uh, uh, hunting techniques, uh, the way they found their food, the way they made their shelters, as they moved around the world, understanding how that kind of society, which from everything we've uh, seen from the, all the studies show that they were in effect communistic because what does it mean um, to, be, to be communistic it means there were no lords there were no barons there were no ruling classes because there couldn't be in those conditions a, a small group of humans had to work in solidarity with each other and go hunting together look out for each other and there's no way you can go hunting and say, right, now I'm taking 90% of the hunt. You guys can le le eat what's left. Wouldn't be a very popular hunter. Well, next time you'd be, you wouldn't be part of the hunt, would you? Uh, it's, there's a material basis to the communistic way of living of, of, of early humans. And that has been shown many times over uh, by anthropological studies. How did we get from that to the society we live in today, where it is a case that people work together in, say, a big factory, some of them get just the basic wage and a large chunk of the wealth they produce is taken by somebody else who's called a capitalist or the owner. There are classes, there are privileged layers of people living above the rest of society. Um, and it's an understanding of how that happened 
Um, now, I'm not going to go into the details here because there's lots of texts that people can read, but we understand that as humans be- develop their techniques, especially with the evolution of the, the emergence of agriculture in its different forms, started to create something which humans had not known before then, which was um, a surplus, an ability to actually produce more than what is necessary to keep one individual alive. When that happens, the work of one individual can actually sustain several people. So there's a surplus to his work. That's the material basis upon which a new figure can emerge in society, somebody who starts to appropriate that surplus. Um, And you start to get these elites within society, which can only be backed up by having armed groups in their defense. The wealth is used, obviously, to to pay these armed men. Like, in Roman society, they would not have been able to keep the slaves in position without the Roman army. I mean, Spartacus proved that beyond any doubt. Mm. He he really worried them uh, for yeah. a long period well, of time. Well, he resisted that army for quite a long time. That's right. He, he took up arms against them. And if they didn't have a Roman army, the slaves would have overthrown the system. So this kind of society emerges um, and creates a new form of society, slavery, feudalism, capitalism. They're different m- ways of production, means you know, modes of production. But there's one thing in common. There's a mass of people doing the work And there's a minority at the top that accumulates the wealth, creates an apparatus to defend their privileged position. And then this is transmitted to society as this is how it has always been, is and will always be. Therefore, give up on any idea of trying to change society. We don't agree with that. We think society has changed many times throughout history. Many different forms of society have existed, and capitalism is not the final product of historical development. Capitalism is one stage in the development of humanity, just as feudalism was a stage. It lasted something like a thousand years, but it was a stage. Now, if you were living in the middle of feudalism, you would have probably thought, this is how the world has always been and always will be. And yet one day, something happened. Crowns started to, to, to fall. Kings started to be uh, removed. And, and their heads removed. And, their, and they lost their heads, some of them. And um, a bourgeois revolution brought into being a different system, the capitalist system. Um, but we believe, if you want to ask what we believe, capitalism plays a role for a period, as feudalism played a role for a period. Um and it reaches a point where it, it exhausts its historical role, i.e. it can no longer take society forward, it starts actually to move in the other direction. And the, the, the world we live in today, I, we believe, is a confirmation of that. Here we have some of the most advanced technology that we've ever seen. We, humans can do incredible things. We're discovering the solar system. We've gone beyond the solar system. We have telescopes that can see, you know, billions of light years away. Um, We understand so much more, and yet we have children starving to death. We have hunger. We have poverty. We have homelessness. At the same time, we have a layer of society living in extreme luxury um, based on the work of the millions of workers. If you want to ask us what we believe, we believe... This cannot last forever. Um, Occasionally, the downtrodden rise up. If you don't mind me adding a little detail. By all means. I was visiting Lewis over the weekend and I went to the castle. By the way, if those of you who are listening outside of the UK aren't aware, Lewis is a place, not a person. Yeah, Lewis is a little... In this case. It's a little town um, near the southern coast, not far from Brighton. There's a castle there. I visited it and it tells you how the peasants saw the people that lived in the castle. It's actually there for the tourists to read. It says they described them as devils. Then there's another little detail. What happened during the peasants' revolt in the 1380s? The local peasants, before moving on to London, attacked the castle, smashed everything up. To me, that brought out the hatred of the oppressed um, towards the oppressor 
And I'm thinking, for centuries, those peasants must have felt enormous resentment towards these devils that lived in the castles, but they had no way of changing the world. They had no way of removing that. The Peasants' Revolt was one of those moments in history where those downtrodden peasants suddenly were given this chance to rise up and fight against their oppressors. And what do they do? They raid the local castle. Prior to that, one of the only ways the peasants had of expressing their grievances towards their lords, if there was a famine, for example, would be to literally lie down on their land and starve to death, to lean against the wall of the castle ramparts and starve to death in protest. So you can imagine what it must have felt like to a peasant, finally, to... To rise up. To rise up, to take arms in hand and to finally try. Obviously, it was a defeated revolution. or Obviously, it was a defeated movement. But nevertheless, to try and take some control over your life for the first time ever. But you see, history um, has many moments in which we've seen this. You can go through long periods where it does seem as if nothing is happening. You know, everybody's in their place. The peasant is on the land and he does what he's told. Or the workers in the factories. But... There are moments in which the crisis of society brings to the surface a revolutionary fervor uh, from below, and you see moments in which society can be radically changed. What we believe is history teaches that that happens on a regular basis throughout history, and it hasn't ended. It's going to happen again and again, but this time it's going to be The workers in a capitalist society, in an industrial modern society, faced with the the conditions that capitalism creates around them, you know, the, the, the growing poverty, the eating away of the value of wages, the destruction of the infrastructure, the healthcare system, education, etc., a constant increasing of the burden on the shoulders of working people will re lead at a certain point to an eruption from below. And that will be a moment in history which will give us a chance to put an end to class society and actually create a different society. It will be the beginning of a new period in human history. That's what we believe. All right, that's a very thorough start to the autocomplete interview. Question two. Why, why, Fred, do communists want to take my property? (laughs) I don't mean specifically my property. I mean uh, the royal mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do communists want to take people's property? Yes, well, this is a common question which is asked, as if to say, what's behind it is this. Communists are lazy, no good for nothing louts. Um, The only way they can imagine getting property is by taking away the hard-earned property of other people. Yeah, they're envious. They're deeply jealous of the wealth and riches of the Elon Musk's. And the Jeff Bezos of the world who right. honestly were earned their massive corporations yeah. through hard graft and inheriting actually, the occasional emerald mine. Yeah. Well, it's actually, the truth of the matter is this. It's actually not possible to accumulate huge amounts of wealth through simply eight hours labor a day. The only way you can accumulate wealth is actually by exploiting the labor of somebody else. Right. The labor time of somebody else. Um, they work for you, you pay them a certain amount, but obviously you make a profit. But the question is this, communists don't want to take people's individual property away from them. Why would any? Why would I want to take somebody's house? It's ridiculous. What we're actually talking about is not the taking away of everybody's property. This is the scare, oh, the scaremongering, yeah. oh, they come, they'll take, take a toothbrush. Everything. They'll take yeah, everything. No, it's the... It's private property of the means of production that we're talking about, i.e. we are talking about the big multinational corporations, the big, um, the big companies that dominate. It, it is literally the case now that a few hundred big multinational corporations dominate the world economy. And in each country, you can find several hundred companies that are responsible for a huge part of the production. Right. Now, what we say is, that private property should be expropriated, should be made public, and should be used for the good of humanity. Not the house or the back garden or the car or the stereo or whatever it is that people own individually. They're not, you see, the point is this. The private ownership of a house or a car is not the cause of the crisis. Right. 
It's the private property of the means of production, the big ones. But also, just as a point of information, we were talking about this yesterday, something like 86% of um, landlords in Britain are what are known as portfolio landlords, which That's means right. they have at least four properties, That's right. only one of which presumably they live in long term. Maybe they have a whole day home, but the rest they simply use as assets in order right. to extract wealth from other people or the form of rent. That's right. So the vast majority of people don't own a home. That's Even right. those who think they do, really, in most cases, the bank owns your home. That's what a mortgage is. You don't own that home. The That's bank right. owns that home. The bank owns that property. And you pay them off over the course of however many decades. And more people than that are renting. Who, yes. they, well, they, 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 they don't even have a mortgage. They don't That's even right. have an eventual claim to the property that they live in. We well, see that take housing, mm. you know, one of the most important items that a, an ordinary working class or, you know, any working family can aspire to own is the house, right. right? Which takes decades for most families to achieve through a mortgage, through paying interest. If they ever do. Yeah, if, if they do. Now, you see, they say that capitalism uh, works because it's based on private property and everybody wants property, etc., but if we look at what's happening today, um, families, let's say the previous generation, um, my parents, I remember, they started with nothing and they managed to buy themselves a house. This was at the peak of the boom. But in those days, the value of a house was, much, was actually much lower relative to wages. So working class people could actually afford to get onto the property ladder. Since then, what we've seen is... Precisely what you're saying, you know, the, the big landlords who are grabbing the property and um, in a situation where people obviously need to live somewhere, if you have control over the housing stock, you can push up the rent and, even, and the price also uh, has massively gone up. Um, so in reality, a lot of people don't even have their own house as a private property. So it's funny that the capitalist class should accuse communists of wanting to take people's property in the sense of your house. When in actual fact, it's the capitalists who are taking away people's small property, such as in housing. The percentage of families that can actually afford to buy their property now is going down. So it's actually the capitalists who are taking away property. Um, if anything, as communists... We would defend the right of a working class family to hold on to its house, but we would explain it's because of the private property, i.e. this big percentage of the housing stock which is owned by big landlords, plus the ownership of the big means of production, the, the, the big corporations, the big companies, the factories, the offices, etc., which are used to maximize the profit of the small minority, that is the kind that is the private property right. which we say should be eliminated because that is the cause of the crisis that we're living in. I just did a quick Google. Google's doing a lot of the hard work in this episode. Um, and it turns out that in the 1970s in Britain, a home in London on average cost about four times a worker's annual, annual wage. wage. So this is the median. That's about, um, that's, income. Yeah, that's right. Today, it's about 14 times. That's so that right. gives some idea of the scale. I think this is the way that we can summarize the question. We can't take away what you don't have. Marx made this point. The working class is a class which owns essentially nothing. You know, w what do you own? If you're watching this episode at home, chances are you're an ordinary working person. You own the clothes on your back. You own uh, a phone. You own... Maybe a car, if you're lucky. <laughs> you own some furniture. You own some bits and pieces that you need to carry out the essential tasks of life. These things are functionally worthless. They mean nothing in the grand mm -hmm. scheme of things. They can't be used as investable assets. They can't be used to generate any more profit. They might as well not exist as far as the grander scheme of the economy is concerned. Really speaking, you own nothing. And a tiny, tiny fraction of humanity owns essentially everything. Mm -hmm. We don't want to take your property away. I'm pointing at the screen if you're listening to the audio version. We don't want to take away your property, listener, viewer, because chances are you don't have any. 
but you want to expropriate the property of the 1% or the 1% of 1% who control the levers of production, as we would put it. That's right. Well, for example, in Britain, they privatize the water companies. The, uh, the private owners of the water companies are making fat profits, sucking money out of the state, and we have the most pol- polluted waters we've ever had. Yeah, pumping literal in crap into the rivers. That's right. So there's an example of, they say, oh, you know, the reason the Labour government says we cannot nationalize water is they say it would cost $100 billion. The answer of communists would say is, no, it wouldn't cost $100 billion. They have already made big amount of money by controlling those companies. Those companies should be publicly owned. You should expropriate them and make them public again. They don't need that. You don't pay them $100 billion. No. You expropriate In subsidies, you... they've, they've been paid out of the public purse many times over That's right. for the value they've made of that it, asset. Many time, and they've destroyed the service yes. as a result. That's the proof that private property of the means of production, in this mm-hmm. case, the production of clean, um, potable, drinkable water, doesn't work with right. capitalist methods. Right. And we could say the same of the transport network, the railways, railways, about the health structure, service, but education, we'll everything. We'll have to move on. But I think that the, the question's adequately answered, so we'll move on. Question three. Why do communist countries have dictators? Because, of well, course, you know, dictators are unheard of in capitalist countries, apparently. Well... First of all, capitalist countries also have dictators. Hitler was a dictator, Mussolini, Franco, Pinochet. Um, We have had many, many dictators of capitalist countries. But the reason that question gets asked is because, first of all, Russia under Stalin and Eastern Europe and other countries of that kind, first of all, they're defined by the media as communist. And then, of course, they are dictatorships. And therefore, why does communism produce dictators? Well, first of all, we have to unravel this and say they were not communist. Even they themselves didn't call their countries communist. They called them, you know, Soviet socialist republics, etc. The idea was that they were building towards communism. The truth is that um, genuine communism is based on public ownership of the means of production but also the management and control of those means of production by the mass of working people themselves through elected bodies, etc. Um, in these countries, you didn't have that. You didn't have the election of the officials. You didn't have the election of, um, of um, the people at the top. Um, and what you also had was a bureaucracy which had risen above society, living in privileged conditions. They were living above the conditions of the working class. It was a classic bureaucracy that emerged. Um, The reason for that is, um, I mean, you can read Trotsky on the revolution betrayed and and other texts on that. But the reason for that is that uh, you cannot have uh, a genuinely planned economy that works within one single country. Two, especially in a relatively backward economy where you have to build up uh, the resources such as in in, in Russia after 1917. The Russian Revolution was not envisaged as a national revolution. The Russian, uh, the Bolsheviks, saw it as the beginning of a world revolution. That failed because of the leaders of the social democracy in other countries that blocked that process. But once that had happened, the bureaucracy that emerged um, had a material um, condition which was different to the mass of working people. Now, in any society like that, um, if you had a genuine workers' democracy, the workers would have the ability to question and challenge the bureaucrats, challenge the way they managed, challenge what they were doing, challenge the fact that they were living above the conditions of the working class, And if it was a genuine democracy, they would be able to remove them and elect others who represent them. That means that inevitably, once you have a bureaucracy like that, it will move in the direction of a dictatorship. Um, It has to be like that because any any element of workers' rights would would mean to the workers challenging those bureaucrats. 
But that would mean they would lose the privilege, privileges which go with being a bureaucrat and an official. And therefore, you have these dictatorships, but that's not communism. That we, we would, I mean, it, it's a Stalinist type uh, dictatorship in one country after another in, in, in that part of the world. So communism does not produce dictators, but the contrary. But a, a degeneration of a revolution like the one we saw in Russia, in the conditions in which we saw it, eventually does produce that phenomenon. Yeah, and I think that people should listen to our previous episode on the question of socialism in one country with Nicholas, because he goes into some of the right, nuts and bolts it. of the impossibility of achieving that and what actually emerged in the USSR and elsewhere. Uh, next question. Why does communism not work? Doesn't get much blunter than that, but uh, there yeah, we are. We've, we pass it to Google, so we won't complain. Well, you see, the, the capitalist system, they say, works. Well, let's look at that. Uh, let's look around the world today. This cap is capitalism creating a flourishing society that's moving forward, that feels confident that things are better today than they were yesterday, and tomorrow's going to be even better. The health service is getting better all the time. Education is getting better all the time. Life is wonderful, and there's no wars, there's no diseases, there's no famine, there's no climate change, there's none of that. I'm saying it like this purposely because anybody that listens to that will realize that what well, actually Capitalism doesn't work either. What capitalism does, it seems to work for certain periods, and they can last a few decades. Like if you take Germany between 1890 and just before the First World War, seemed to be working. Standard of living of workers was going up. Wages were going up. Um, they were getting pensions. They were getting um, granted reforms. A similar period were after the Second World War, roughly 25 years, you know, from the end of the war to the mid-70s, um, the NHS was established. When I went to university, you were given a grant. You didn't come out of university with um, a lot of money uh, in debt. That must have been nice. Yeah, you got a grant, and it was basically, you, 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 you were given your independence, and your education was paid for, and you came out with your degree mm. without all the burden of debt that young people have today. So in that period, it did seem, yes, capitalism seemed to be working. Again, careful with that it seemed to be working in some countries mm. western europe north america a few other places like australia japan and a few other advanced capitalist countries in the former colonial world in latin america in africa in large parts of asia it wasn't working so well that explains actually why in that period you had so many revolutionary movements in that part of the world um so there are periods in which it seems to work, and then in, in certain parts of the world and for certain layers of the population. But then it goes into crisis. And when it goes into crisis, it turns into its opposite. So we would say capitalism isn't working. Now the question is this, why, doesn't why didn't communism work? Well, it's connected to the previous answers. It wasn't communism that failed because communism was never achieved in, in, uh, in these countries. You see, in, uh, in capitalism, there is an element of truth in what they say. There's a kind of self-regulating mechanism, i.e., if a capitalist makes a TV which explodes when you, t when you turn it on, nobody's going to buy any more of those, mm. and they're going to have to design a TV that does not explode. Yeah. So it's in his interests, that capitalist, to make things that work. When you have a, bureauc a bureaucracy that is interested in meeting targets and producing huge quantities of goods so they can just tick off and say target reached um, and the quality is bad, um, there's no market that, to regulate it. Now, in that kind of system, the only way you can make sure there's a regulation of the quality is by having workers' democracy, i.e., if the TVs are bad... It's the workers who produce them are also the people that use them. If you have workers' democracy, they can say, just a minute, this guy has designed a really bad TV, back to the drawing board, redesign until we have something that we can use. But that would require workers' democracy. It would require workers' power, which would also mean that the guys doing this 
would not be living separate from the working class, above the working class, in a privileged condition. They would be under the democratic control of the, of the work of the workers. That would be the way to have a regulating mechanism on the quality, the quantity of goods, what we produce, how we produce it, in the interests of, of humanity as a whole. So communism can work. It has never actually been achieved. Now, people say, ah, so it's never been achieved, so it will never be achieved. Well, my answer to that is, actually, capitalism hasn't always existed. There was a time in which there was no such thing as capitalism. There was no such thing as bourgeois um, owners of the means of production. It wasn't even that long ago in the grand scheme of things. That's right, just a few centuries. In some parts, it only developed in the the last 50, 60 years, to be honest. Mm. Um, You know, consolidated its position. Um, now, if you'd have gone back into that period, imagine imagine a, a couple of people speaking in a field under feudalism, and one says, do you know, I don't, this society we live in where we have to work all day digging land mm. for a pittance. Yeah, eight of my children yeah. have died this year. That's right. All the disease. No, we want a society where we have factories that make machi- uh, tools that produce tractors so we don't have to dig the land. It probably would have been seen as completely utopian. What are you talking about? What, People have what is a tractor? That's right. Would have been the first right. question, I And think. yet capitalism came into being mm. through revolutions. As capitalism came into being, so can the future communist society. And the difference, of course, being that the bourgeois didn't themselves set out to create capitalism as a world system. They instinctively follow their class interests when they went to war with feudalism, with the divine right of kings, with the arbitrary power of the crown well, and taxation and so on, when they developed industry, developed science and techniques so that they could, yeah. you know... Well, the, comp- well, the bourgeois were em- emerged, obviously, within the system. Mm. Um, they needed their space within society. Right. They needed instruments of power to function which came into contradiction with the way the feudal system worked. Sure. And therefore, even though they weren't conscious of where they were going, mm. they were inevitably coming into conflict with the feudal aristocracy. But the difference with socialism is that we are conscious of yes. what we're fighting for. The difference is that the working class has ideas, it has a tradition, and it has methods of struggle. And we're in the process of trying to develop a revolutionary yes. leadership that has a program ready-made when the movement that becomes the revolution in a given country breaks out and knows what to do to begin the task of constructing a new form of society. Yes. We're seeing it already. I mean, I mean, it's not the purpose here, but if you look around the world, the overthrow of the dictator in Bangladesh this mm. year, the big movement in Kenya, the movement last year in Sri Lanka, we saw on TV screens, uh, phone screens or whatever it is, computer screens people look at, we saw... Revolutions. We we saw ordinary people en masse going to the presidential palace, of removing the hated dictators. Why do they do that? Because life has become intolerable for them. Um, that's the beginning of a process. The point is, of course, is it's not enough to be angry and rebelling against what you have. You've got to have a clear idea of what is going to replace it. Mm. And that's where the role of communists comes in. All right. Here's a good one. Are communists atheists? Um, well, if you want the short answer is yes, yeah. in the sense that... Th- these two communists are atheists. Yeah. I, um, I mean, I, I was brought up a Catholic, but uh, I started to realize that what they preached and what they actually did... My mother actually had an old saying, you know, she was a peasant. She said, do what the priest tells you, do not do what the priest does. And I used to think... That's a vote of confidence, isn't it? I thought, that's a bit of a contradiction. Why should I listen to somebody telling me to do stuff that he's not prepared? What, what, it, what it meant was, be good, help the poor, etc. Um, abide by the, the laws, abide by the rules of society, you know, but... If the priest doesn't do that because the priest is is greedy and is taking more than he should do or behaving in a corrupt manner, well, 
don't don't copy what he does. Um, it's a bit of a contradiction. But to get back to the to the actual question, um, we're materialists, i.e., we look at the material world, we analyze the world as it is, the the, the real material um, that we have in front of us. Um, we look at science, we understand how matter functions, how society moves, how history moves, and we look at all the material factors. We don't believe there's some kind of spirit outside of this world intervening and affecting um, the world that we live in. Um, and we believe that if we really want to change society, it's this society that we change, mm -hmm. not the next in the next world. You know, it's um, um, the, 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 the power that religion has over the minds of many people is, I've heard it many times, say, yes, when we're all dead, we're all equal. Mm. you know um etc i suppose it's true we're all equally dead um but while we're alive some lived in luxury and others lived in poverty um now the question comes to this can you be a communist and not be an atheist well i would say if you're a marxist and understand the marxist philosophical outlook the the conclusion of the thinking is clearly um that there isn't a spirit world but you can be a worker that believes in communism, i.e. believes in a world where the wealth that's produced by working people is used collectively for the good of the whole of society. You want to fight this uh, society that's based on privilege, on the use of wealth um, to strengthen the position of the wealthy and oppress the masses. Mm -hmm. You want to fight for a better world, but you still have your religious views. We, as, as Marxists, as, as, as revolutionary communists would say, if a communist who has religious views and a communist that doesn't agree on the actual program we want to carry out, if they agree that the fight is to expropriate that tiny minority of capitalists, nationalize the means of production, place them under workers' control and management, and run society in a communist way, mm. if we agree on that and we're prepared to fight together, I have no problem with a communist that says, I have these beliefs as well. I respect that. Let's fight to change this world. Mm -hmm. The next world we can always discuss in, under a future communist society, and we'll see where society goes on that. Or I guess when we're both dead, maybe we'll get to discuss it then? Well, if they're right, yeah. Well, people have different opinions on what you can do after. But after look, I think that we also need to draw a bit of a distinction here because we're Marxists, right? Marxism is a school of ideas, and it bases itself on the philosophical method of dialectical materialism. It's a materialist philosophy. It's an atheist philosophy, explicitly so. But communists have come from all different traditions in the course of history. We've said on this show that the early Christians in the period where they were basically an oppressed, radical Jewish sect, were communistic. Yes. They were, of course, religious. They were deeply religious, and they framed their communistic tendencies and their belief in liberation from Roman oppression in religious terms. Well, the early Christians, if you joined them, mm -hmm. you had to give over all your property. Right, exactly. You had to renounce your property, actually. Yeah. Um, in the Acts of the Apostles, there are moments where you see one there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's a famous one the husband and wife who join mm -hmm. and don't give all their property yeah and they're called to answer why and actually god strikes them dead yeah. in that moment why because they didn't renounce all their property it's a rather curious one a lot of people who claim to be christian today and may and and, and will not appreciate the communists mm. let's say um probably don't get that highlighted in their religious studies no. that the, the god of the early christians would strike dead a husband and the wife because they didn't give up all their property that is the confirmation that the early christians were actually revolutionaries against the slaveholding system and they can't even entirely hide behind the new testament because jesus also said that it was easier for a camel to pass through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter heaven. That's right. It's overturned all, it's, the right. tables of the money lenders at the temple. Um, it's anyway, all there. But it's can I just there. add something else about, about religion? You see, 
religion has changed over time. Mm. Religious views have changed. Now, Christianity, Islam, Judaism have been around for a few thousand years. You know, Christianity, 2000. Islam, a little bit later, 1500 years or so. Uh, Judaism claims to go back a thousand years maybe before um, Christ. At the very most, we're talking about 3,000 years. Now, it's been shown uh, by all the evidence, uh, the archaeological, the genetic, that Homo sapiens has been around for probably around 300,000 years mm -hmm. as a species. Yeah. That means that for 1% of humanity's existence, it has had one of these three major religions. Then there's Hinduism, there's Buddhism. But we're talking about this kind of period in which these religious views have existed. The further back you go, the, 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 the greater the difference in religious views. You go right, right back to the time when people would pray to the animal they'd killed and ask its spirit to return. Um, or, or they believed that trees had a soul, mountains could think, you had to feed the mountain, etc. The further back you go, the, diff the, the greater differences you see, and you see an evolution. So my view is this, if, re if the religion is a truth, surely it should have been true for humans from day one. Instead, for a very long period of time, the religion reflected the structure of the society. As society changed, for example, from the polytheistic religions where you had many gods, as you have the rise of the state with one leader, the, the emperor, the king, etc., the religions also started to change accordingly and in, in their structure. So um, people who adhere to religion will see it as their truth. We as Marxists would look at it a little bit more objectively from a long view of history and see that it's a reflection of a way of thinking of a particular moment in their development. And just as religion and the attitudes of humans to religion has changed as society has changed, mm. changing society again mm. in the future will inevitably impact the way people view religion. And we can go into that in more detail maybe in another episode. Basically, to summarize, Marxism is an atheist philosophy it's an atheist school of thoughts but of course there are millions of working people who are religious who might well agree with communist ideas who might share our perspective and absolutely we have an open hand to all people of all beliefs and persuasions if they agree with the struggle to overthrow capitalism and win a better existence for the majority of people in this life. In that yes. sense, of course, you can be a communist and hold religious views. Let's work together to change this world. Yeah. Whatever your view is on that question. Nicely put. All right. Well, I think we'll move on. It's another good one. Are communists nationalists? Well, before we go any further, we should say that Fred is of um, Italian heritage, so he brings a slightly different national perspective than I do as a Welsh. as a as a I'm Welshman. Also, I'm also partially Welsh. I was born in Wales. Um, nationalism and communism. You see, the slogan at the end of the Communist Manifesto is "Workers of the World Unite." Marx pointed out that workers have no nation, and if you think about migration. Well, the, the United States itself as a country is the product of the fact that many workers from many countries around the world, initially starting in Europe, but then spreading elsewhere, the nation that they belonged to or the country they lived in had nothing to offer them in terms of work, income, or even the, the, the prospect of some kind of improvement in their lives. So they went where the work was. In effect, workers go where the work is. And if that means you leave your country, you leave it. Millions went across the United States. Millions of in initially English people, followed by the Germans, the Scandinavians, then the Italians, um, and many other peoples, the East Europeans, the, the Irish, Spanish, the Russians. Um, and then more recently, obviously, from... from um, uh, Asia, from Africa, uh, the Latinos from Latin America. That is a proof of the fact that um, 
the real nation of the working people is where the work is, where the where you can get your wages. Now, um, the other side of it is this. Uh, the capitalist system is a global system. No single capitalist country can function within the borders of its own countries, um, of, of a country. You know, the criticism, you know, the, to go back to the discussion before, socialism in one country is not possible. But people forget that capitalism in one country is not possible either. Right. America, for instance, requires a world market to exist. China requires a world market because the tendency under capitalism is to overproduce, to produce more than your local market can absorb. And the only way that you can exist and function is by exporting a part of what you produce. That's one side of it. The other is no single country has all the resources that are required for a modern economy. You know, uh, the, the earth didn't evolve in such a way as to make sure that in every future nation that emerged, there would be enough iron, enough silver, enough lead, enough this, that, and the other, um, that each country could function uh, almost in autarky. No, the world is made the way it is. Um, the minerals are, are spread around the way they are. The resources are where they are. Therefore, the only way one country can function as a capitalist country is by trading with others getting the raw materials they require, and then exporting the final products. Or stealing from others. Or stealing, yes, of course, the imperialists, etc. But even that, that is a proof that capitalism in England could not survive within the borders of England or Britain, or the United yep. Kingdom, whatever you want to call it. The way it could survive, the only way it could survive was through imperialism, mm -hmm. going out and basically dominating and literally stealing the raw materials sure. from the peoples that, um, that were living in Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. I go to the British Museum, and, I mean, materials aside, in terms of the artistic and cultural accomplishments yes. of these places, you can find quite a lot of them locked away in the vaults of museums yes. here in Britain. But going back to the question, are communist nationalists? Well, no. The, answer to the, 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 the immediate short answer is no. But there's always a but. It's no. If, if nationalism, to me, means I have to identify with my ruling class because I belong, I speak the same language. Mm. You know, I speak English, therefore I should identify with King Charles. Yes, or when and you speak Italian, you should identify with Giorgio Maloney. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's not how we would view it. Um, if nationalism means that what comes first is the nation you belong to, i.e., I'm working class, you're middle class, he's a bourgeois, a capitalist, because we all were born in one country, we speak the language and we, we're citizens of that country, we have a, a stronger common interest because of that. We would argue, no, I, as a worker, have more in common with the workers of other countries than with my own boss, my own ruling class. And the truth is this, the ruling classes, the capitalists of individual countries, have more in common with their capitalist friends in other countries. The fact that we live in the epoch of multinational corporations that operate beyond the national borders, and these corporations have an interest which is against the workers of all the individual countries. Mm. Therefore, the solution to fighting this is not a nationalist one. It cannot be that, although there are attempts to do it. Trump, make America great again. Farage talks about, the you know, um, uh, Britain, etc. Meloni will talk about you know Italy and um, as a nation, as if we can solve the problems of say the unemployed of each country by uniting with the bosses. The bosses are actually the cause of the problems. So in that sense, no, we're not nationalists. We're internationalists. We believe that it's the coming together of workers of different countries that can solve the problems. Having said that. You see, what I find often is the way they try to portray communists and left-wing people is um, they hate the country they live in. They yeah. hate their own country. If you hate Britain so much, then why don't you just go to go Cuba somewhere else, or go right. to Vietnam? Or... But that's not true. You see, we don't hate the country we live in. Actually, we love the countries that we live in. Yeah, It's precisely because we love the country that we want everybody in this country to have a good job, to have good wages, we want everybody in this country to be able to have a good education for their kids. We want everybody to have a good healthcare system available for them 
rather than having to pay for it. Because the way we're going, in this so-called national unity, some people are going to be able to afford the private health care they want to force us to pay for, and the poorer layers are not. Where's the national unity where a section of the population literally is looking at the possibility of dying early because they can't afford the health care that they want to force on us, on us in the future? So that's not the national... That's not... Uh, that's not what we love. What we we love is the country we live in should be a country where everybody can live a reasonable life. But that means, logically, that loving your own country means also loving the countries of other people too. Right. Because it's only collaborating together with people in other countries that we can actually achieve the kind of life we would like to have. Now... You, people can be proud of their cultural heritage. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong in being proud of Shakespeare or Dante or what, what, whatever, whatever culture you, you, you adhere to. That's a different question. You can be proud of that. You can be proud of your, your language. You can be proud of the food, depending on... Yeah, depending, but that's, uh, maybe, maybe in the UK that's a slightly tougher sell. Depending on the country you live in. About, Slight, a slightly but, tougher sell in the UK. That, that is a separate... The point is this. The nationalism which says that what comes first is the unity of the poor with the rich mm. of each country is a nationalism we reject. Yes. Now, there's also different types of nationalisms. There's the nationalism, which emerged since, let's say, the peak of the British Empire, Yeah. which treated the people that they were colonizing as inferior, almost animal-like people. Often worse than animals. Yeah. Well, slavery itself. The way they justified slavery, yeah. for example, and the slave trade... Yeah, slave masters treated to, their dogs better than they treated human well, beings. Well, well, the way to do it was to actually create the idea that black people are inferior, or not even human, fully human. That makes it easier to treat them like animals. That was the worst nationalism that we've seen in the sense of the idea of a supreme or superior people. Um... That that's one kind of nationalism, um, the extreme form which we would reject. There's another, however, which is the nationalism of the oppressed peoples, and there are sometimes the, you, you see the nationalism of a let's say the nationalism of an African people mm. or an Asian people or the Palestinians, perhaps. Uh, the Palestinians I mean, is you, another you've example. Been on, you've been on uh, telly a couple of times in the past few weeks where you specifically made the point that we as communists support the aspiration of the Palestinian people to a homeland. That's right. To a nation. Every people has the right to a homeland. Um, now, the nationalism of oppressed peoples, for instance, the nationalism of the peoples who rose up against the British Empire, the nationalism of the Indians as they rose up against the British. It's a different kind of nationalism to the nationalism which was of the British who were oppressing them. It had it had a revolutionary kernel to it. It had a revolutionary content to it because it was the aspirations of a whole people to remove the oppressor. Yeah, it was a strike against colonialism and imperialism by necessity. That's right. That's why it's not there's not, there's not one form of nationalism. Sure. It's also true that once these nations have achieved nationhood. India removed the colonial yoke. Then the same nationalism, which earlier on would have been the nationalism of an oppressed people, mm. can transform itself into the nationalism of a Modi. Well, let's take, for example, the question of the struggle for Irish liberation. James Connolly famously said, That's while right. at one stage armed and organized alongside with bourgeois Republican nationalists, he said to the working class elements, basically, if we succeed, keep hold of your guns and watch out for these guys, watch out for these bourgeois right. nationalists, because they're going to be our enemies. That's right. If you think about it today in India, the nationalism of a Modi um, has within it the oppression of the Muslims of India. You know, it, why? Why? because they need to divide and rule, to distract attention from the, um, the problems of Indian capitalism, um, the Hindu majority is pushed against the Muslim minority. Mm. Um, so where's the nationalism here? Are, yes. are the Muslims of India not also Indian citizens? 
And this happens in many countries. You have these minorities. Where's the nationalism? Yes. If, if, if nationalism is everybody in that country who's a citizen should come together, how do you explain this phenomenon? Yeah, well, Lenin once said, I think that you, you um, alluded to it earlier, that nationalism can be the shell within which is contained a revolutionary kernel. But he also said that it could be a shell which contains a reactionary kernel. Of course. And he, Lenin was always very clear, even in contexts where the communists unequivocally supported the struggle of an oppressed people. Mm -hmm. In the case of I mean, Poland comes to mind, for example, he nevertheless insisted on the independence of the working class elements. He said that you must not blend your banners That's with right. the bourgeois nationalists That's because right. when it comes down to it they're they're not our allies no but we, we see we've seen it many times where the the a, a nation aspiring to nationhood finally achieves it and then within it, its borders you have oppression of other peoples um you you look across many countries you'll see it um minorities sometimes significant minorities that are oppressed within that nation which earlier was in a fight against the imperialist dom dominator. So nationalism changes over time. Mm -hmm. But the, the, if you want to give the final short answer is we're internationalists. And we believe that workers of each country can defend their interests far better in a common struggle with the workers of other countries and not in a common front with their own oppressors. All right, last one. What would communism look like? <laughs> um, we, we don't know. End the episode. That's it. <laughs> yes. Well, um, you know, uh, would the capitalists who, or the bourgeois that fought under Cromwell to change society in Britain have really been able to answer the question, what would advanced capitalism look like? Well, they, they didn't even know they were going to kill they, King they Charles to begin with. They, they, wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have known. Um, but what we can say is it's, it's, it's also not true to say that, oh, we don't know anything. We mm. do know. First of all, it would be a nationalized planned economy. Uh, the means of production, the big means of production would be publicly owned. They would not function on the basis of profit for a private individual, but would be used for the benefit of, humani of humanity as a whole. Just to go back to the question of water. If water were publicly owned, mm -hmm. the money that we've thrown away over the years to the private investors would have been used to improve the techniques, to massively increase the capacity to recycle water, to cleanse water, and not to throw waste into rivers. But that doesn't apply. People sometimes say, oh, yeah, water is okay. The railway is the same thing. We would have created a much better railway network had it been public, even under capitalism, by the way. But under a communist society, a publicly owned transport would actually mean, for example, providing transport, uh, good quality transport, to such a level that we could massively reduce the amount of vehicles on the, on the roads, which are contributing enormously to pollution and to the health of people who have to sm breathe the air that uh, these fumes um, pollute. Um, so it would be publicly owned, it would be planned, but who would be running these companies? Again, it would not be capitalists because there would be no private ownership of the means of production, but it wouldn't be unelected, untouchable bureaucrats either. It would have to be officials who are elected to the position. Now people say, oh, you can't have it, elect meetings every day. Of course not. You can't have an assembly every day on how to run a factory. But you can have regular assemblies over a period. You can have uh, different opinions expressed on how that company should be run. And according to um, you know, a, a well-informed workforce, um, you would be able to proceed to elections of officials. Who, whose job would be to run that particular unit of production. Um, elected to a position like that, the workers would elect those you would think would be the most experienced, the most skilled, the most educated in that field. But they would be required um, not to earn the, the wages of privilege, but 
to earn the wages of the people who have elected them. Um, and you'd have election of, of, um, of delegates to higher bodies. You'd have the, uh, the, the, uh, the right of recall. Today, they say we have a democracy. What we have today is every five years or so, one group of politicians promises you they will do this, this, and this in order to win the elections. Mm -hmm. They get elected, and then the, the remaining period of the five years is spent discussing why they're not carrying out what they promised, why they're doing this instead of that. We see it today yep. with, with Starmer. Yep. Um, but people have realized that what they voted for is not what they're getting. Where's the mechanism to say, just a minute, stop this. You've been there six months. We can see where you're going. We want to remove you. We want the right to elect people who are definitely going to carry out what they promise. There is no such mechanism under capitalism. Under communism, you would have such a mechanism. It would be, it would be the guy that we've elected is not doing what they're supposed to be doing. We're going to call an assembly to, um, um, to change that elected um, uh, official, or delegate, etc. And it would work all the way through, through the system. Um, the, the means of production that way, the priority would be what is good for the, the whole of society, not what is good for an individual or, or a small group of, of owners. Um, and in such a society, the immense wealth which today is privately appropriated and held by a small minority, you know, these individuals who, you know, they go up in a spacecraft to, to, to just to, to, to feel the effect of weightlessness for a few seconds and it costs them billions to achieve. I prefer the ones that go down to the ocean floor in badly made submarines, personally. Yeah, well, well, yes. But w w when I see that, I think, my God, they have billions to make toys for themselves, basically, where there's people who are going hungry. That's an example of how that wealth, if it, if it was collectively controlled, would be used to solve the real problems of society. Um, Income. They, they say, oh, communists want everybody to be poor, equally poor. Um, no, I think every, communists want everybody to be equally well off. I'm not fighting to make everybody equal to the poorest person on the planet. I'm fighting so that everybody has a decent house. Everybody has a decent school in their neighborhood for their kids, has enough teachers in that school to provide their kids with a good education. Everybody has a clinic or a hospital they can go to in a moment of need. Everybody can go and visit the doctor, not have to call, hoping that you'll get a call back and, and sometimes never get one, but actually have a doctor that's available. That can only be achieved by using the collectively produced wealth of millions in a rational, planned way to provide those services under the control of the working class and if we have an institution which says everybody that's elected can be recalled by the body that elected them at any time if they're not carrying out the program they were elected on, and two, anybody that's elected must live on the wages of the people that have elected them. Because think about it. If being elected to parliament means, like Starmer, you receive £100,000 in donations of clothing, I often wonder, how many clothes do you have to wear? Mm. Or Marcos, you know, the wife of Marcos. Do you remember the dictator? Yeah, yeah. 3,000 pairs of shoes. <laughs> I was trying to work out so how, long, two feet. how long it would take to wear all those shoes, you know. Um, that shows you the absurdity of this system. Um, but if the political system is structured in a way like the one we have, that to be elected to a position automatically puts you on the road of privilege First of all, you start getting an MP's wages, which is a lot higher than a worker's wage. But on top of that, you get all the other perks. You get all the connections. How many politicians do you see retire from politics and that you find them on the board of directors of this company, of that company, or they go and do conferences and they pay them £200,000 yeah. for an hour the of, of talking? They're, they are op they're opening the door to enormous wealth and privilege. Inevitably, a political system that's based on that is going to have corrupt politicians. If we establish the rule, you live on the wage of the workers that elected you, and they are, under, they are going to scrutinize everything you do. 
obviously somebody's elected and has to travel for work will pay for the travel, has to stay in a hotel, pay for the hotel. But the wages that he lives on or she lives on must correspond to the working people that they've elected by. Just to really, really simplify it, if an MP, when he's asked to vote a budget which includes massively increasing the cost of gas or electricity or fuel, lives on the wages of ordinary working people, maybe you'll think twice before doing something like that. Yeah. But when they live in privileged conditions, they act like privileged people and the class they represent. Communism would be the exact opposite of that. Mm. All officials will be elected, would be recallable, and would have to live on the wages of the people that elected them. In that sense, think about it. It would be in their, in their interest then, if you want to improve your standard of living, you've got to improve it for all working people together collectively. Mm. And then, you know, you, you'll have all the services, the good housing, the hospitals, etc. Life would become reasonable and good for the mass of people in the long run, once that such a system gets off the ground and starts functioning, people would see the benefits of such a system. And they say, oh, how could... Once it's established and people look back in history and say there was a time when the wealth you produced was appropriated by a small minority that used it for their own benefit while people starved in some parts of the world. In other parts, there were wars over the resources and spheres of influence. Um, this was what it was like in the past. And you say, do you want to go back to that? I think society would say no. Just as today, you ask any average person, do you want to go back to being a serf yeah. on the land under a feudal lord? Who would say yes to that? Or even under capitalism at a certain stage, you could say, oh, they used to send kids in London up chimneys with long brushes and mm -hmm. they'd clean out the chimneys of the rich and they'd all come down with bent spines and broken bones and they'd have emphysemia and they'd die in their early teens and they'd suffer abuse and exploitation that was a barbaric way to live that was only britain a hundred years ago that's right 150 years ago that was still capitalism yeah it was an earlier form of capitalism but nevertheless it was capitalism but those conditions still exist in places of like course. the congo today that's the thing that hasn't been overcome no. in many places but, around the world but can you can i just add maybe this is one like final thought on this sure you know we can discuss a, a rough idea of what the future society would be and a few basic ideas are there you know the publicly owned um, planned democratically planned and workers control workers management etc um, and the future generations will decide in which direction they want to go but our task today is actually establishing the early conditions for such a society to begin to develop for that to happen capitalism has to be removed mm. the means of production have to be collectively owned the planned economy has to be put in place and has to start mm. functioning the future generations will then carry it forward to i would imagine undreamt of heights which are possible but today the task is actually not to daydream about what the future society will be, but actually to remove this rotten society and allow for the early foundations of a new society to be established. And if we're going to do that, then we need an organization that's capable of providing leadership when it comes to the revolutionary movements that will finally overthrow capitalism in one country after another and lay the basis for socialism, a just, decent form of society that can provide a mode of living worthy of humanity. And we're trying to build exactly that leadership here in the Revolutionary Communist International. As ever, check out our website, marxist.com, and find out more about how you can get involved if you agree with anything that you've heard today. Fred, that was great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me again. And thank you to Google for the very interesting questions. Uh, we'll see you all next week. The spectre is haunting Europe. The spectre of communism. Communism. Stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? I'll guarantee that ten minutes from now, a lot of you are going to have a new understanding of communism. <laughs>